with, uh, with family issues. Father, we just ask, Lord, for you to intervene. Lord, you are the one who can, who can move mountains. Lord, you are the one who cast out demons. You are the one who, who, Lord, healed the sick, raised the dead. And Lord, we come, Lord, in your name and in your authority. And Lord, ask for your deliverance. Father, we ask for your touch. Father, we ask for you to move, Lord, in the hearts and minds of our children. Father, we just ask for this in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, Sukkot. We're going to, uh, it's, I know it's uh, <clears throat> a little bit, uh, a day soon, I know that, uh, but we're going to nonetheless uh, go through this. There's some responsive things we can do, uh, some prayers, some scriptures that we can go through together. Uh, I'm going to start with just the blessing for the season. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lano lag chayim, huchot umoadim lesimcha lechavod Yeshua HaMashiach Adonainu o haolam. Let's all say this together. Blessed, let's go to the next slide. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us holidays, customs, and seasons of happiness for the glory of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, light of the world. Amen. Amen. Ellie, if I can get you to bring me my glasses, they're in my pocket of my coat. One of these days I'll remember everything that I'm supposed to carry up here. Thank you, Father. And uh, so it's very traditional to build a sukkah this week, so uh, a temporary dwelling of some sort. Uh, this is the, the concept of the picture that you can see around the outside. Uh, it's usually just a couple of sticks with some cloth or fabric and, and usually some, lots of branches on it. Um, uh, you hang pomegranates or fruit, and uh, it's, it's a reminder of the tabernacles, the temporary dwellings in the wilderness. And so there's a special blessing for the sukha. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kidshanu b'mitvotav v'tzivanu l'shev basukha. And this is, uh, let's all say this together. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and has commanded us to dwell in the sukha. Now, some of the commandments... Uh, that the rabbis say are not actually commandments in the scriptures, but this one is. This one is. It's a commandment to the children of Israel uh, that when they were in the land, they were to build Sukkot. And here's the passage of scripture. So let's, I have it up there in, from the complete Jewish Bible. Uh, it says this, You are to live in Sukkot for seven days. Every citizen of Israel is to live in a sukha so that the generation after generation you will know that I made the people of Israel live in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Adonai, your God. And so in, in a remembrance of the provision of the Lord and of the Lord's presence dwelling with them in the land or in the wilderness, uh, after they had left, the, uh, left Egypt, the Lord commanded every citizen of Israel to build Sukkot. Another place that we read it is in Exodus chapter 23. Exodus 23 says this, Next, the festival of harvest, the first fruits of your efforts, sowing in the field, and the last festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the fields the results of your efforts. And so we actually, during our Passover, you may remember that uh, it's not quite Passover, but three days later, after Passover is the first fruits, the feast of first fruits. And in fact, they would literally uh, have a tiny bit of wheat right there at the, the temple and they'd cut it and they'd offer that as a wave offering to the Lord. It's first fruits. And then 50 days later, 50 days later is Pentecost or Shavuot. And so Shavuot, you have just gone through the barley and the wheat harvests. And it's a celebration of the, this is the, the, uh, the first in gathering, the first in gathering of the wheat and the, uh, and the barley. And then at the end of the summer, in the autumn, when you have your final in gathering, 
is the Feast of Sukkot. And so in the Northern Hemisphere, in Israel right now, it's, uh, you know, they're harvesting the fields. This is a, this is a time of harvest, and uh, you've had all summer to grow. And, you know, this was to thank the Lord for all that he had provided throughout the year. We also see it mentioned in Romans. Let's read from Romans <clears throat> chapter 11, verses 25 through 26. It says this, I don't want you to be ignorant of the mystery, brothers and sisters, that you might not be conceited. You see, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godliness away from Jacob. Now, this passage in Romans is actually talking about the harvest of souls. It talks here about how the, the children of Israel, there was an initial harvest in the children of Israel. We know that the disciples were there. They, they're all Jewish. They're all of the seed of Abraham, and they had accepted the Lord. Uh, 3,000 on the day of Pentecost came to follow, and then a week or so later, another 5,000 uh, accepted the Lord when Peter uh, raised the lame, Peter and John prayed for the lame man, if you remember that. And so immediately, you have a mega church. If you have 8,000 people who've just accepted Yeshua, guess what you have? That is a mega church. And in those days, uh, based upon the population, uh, that, that was uh, people from all around uh, the diaspora. They'd actually come to Israel for the feast days, and so they took the Holy Spirit with them around the world, uh, back to their homelands or where, they, where their homes were. And so that is the first fruit, and then there's this big, long wait where you have you know, different, you know, different trees give fruit at different times and different, you know, different harvests throughout the year, and we see the gospel going throughout the world gospel going throughout the world, and, and Gentiles turning to the Lord in mass. And yet, at the last days, there is a promise, there is a promise that all Israel will be saved. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean all Jewish people for all time. Uh, it means those that are alive at that time, when Yeshua comes, they will turn to him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only begotten son. And there is a promise for Israel uh, that after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then all Israel will be saved. All right? The deliverer will, will come from Zion. Let's read another passage. This is uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16 says this, verse 15. And this is about the feast. You see, uh, Sukkot was known as the feast. It was the feast. The feast of all feasts. It says, seven days are you to keep the festival for Adonai your God in place, in the place that Adonai your God will choose. Because Adonai your God will bless you in all of your crops and in all of your work, so you are to be full of joy. Did you know that being joyful is a commandment? How many knew that being joyful is a commandment? Not many people are raising their hands. Okay, let me explain this. You are to be full of joy. That's not a request. It's not a question. It's a commandment. Fullness of joy is not the same as fullness of happiness. I want to, I want to talk about the two, a slight difference. Do you know what the word happiness comes from? It comes from the English word happenstance. Happenstance. In other words, it is completely based upon your circumstance same word or similar similar root okay circumstance happenstance happiness is completely based upon uh your circumstances if you have a good circumstance then you have happiness if you have a bad circumstance then you have well not happiness all right and in our society uh happiness is valued extremely highly but it says that the joy of the lord shall be our strength now, the context of the joy of the Lord being our strength is in the midst of judgment and hard times, the joy of the Lord shall be our strength. So, hap so joy, joy has nothing to do with your circumstances. Did you know that? Okay, you know that. Okay, now you know that. Joy has to do with an understanding of who God is. 
and who we are and the end of the story. And so, in the middle of any trial that we are going for, even, even the loss of life, persecution, whatever it may be, the loss of family members, we can experience the joy of the Lord. Because you know what? God knows the end of the story. He knows how it's going to all end. And he's told us. He's given us a lot. He's given us enough. He's given us enough to understand that he wins and that we win when we are in him. Yeah? And that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Now, sometimes we have to be reminded, even like Paul, Paul had a, a messenger of Satan that buffeted him. Yeah, I, I, you know, other than understanding it as a demonic attack that was coming against him, Paul said he asked the Lord to remove this messenger of Satan. And God said no. Instead, do you remember what he said? My grace is sufficient for you. What does, what does, what does grace mean? What is grace? Power. Unmerited favor. Forgiveness, it might include forgiveness, yep. So grace, grace is, is similar to mercy, not exactly the same. I like to explain mercy as not getting what you do deserve. Mercy is when you go before the judge and he says, okay, you deserve to go to jail, but I'm going to let you off with a warning and a $700 fine. Okay, Jail or $700. You know what? That's actually mercy. I didn't get what I deserved. I got off. All right? I'm only speaking from my own personal experience here. <clears throat> I was speeding. I knew I was speeding. As soon as the lights went on behind me, I pulled over. The cop was so excited, he, he, um, he tried very hard not to, not to uh, tell me how excited he was. He was just like, you're the fastest person I've ever caught, and, I'm, I've never, you know, and I, you know, I was just so excited to pull me over. This is years ago. This is back in Texas. Speed limits were 80 miles an hour. That was the speed limit. I was speeding, possibly more than twice the speed limit. But that's beside the point, and I deserved to lose my license and go to jail, but I got mercy. All right, that's mercy. What's grace? I think grace is getting what we don't deserve. or not get, No, so if mercy is not getting what we do deserve, grace is getting what we don't deserve. So I see them as a, as a mirror image. All right, but grace is that unmerited favor from the Lord, right? And if God's grace was sufficient for Paul while he was being buffeted by Satan, and the joy of the Lord is our strength, even in the midst of bad circumstances, I see the two as very connected. That when we are going through, regardless of what we're going through, when we're going through bad times, guess what? We can still have the joy of the Lord. We can still have the Peace that passes understanding. Now, why do you have to have peace that passes understanding? Well, because it's peace that does not correlate to your circumstances. You know, everybody understands that if, 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 you, if you think of a peaceful situation, what do you think of? Think of a picture. Yell out a picture of a peaceful scenario, a peaceful situation. Lying on the beach. Quiet. Clean house, no children. Yeah, yeah, clean house, no children. By the way, was there anybody else on the beach when you were lying there? No. I want you to think about it. Everybody thinks about an idea, but I want, you, I want to ask you, how many people had people in your picture of peace? One, two. Two. Two of you. Okay, so this is my point. In most cases, we don't necessarily associate people with peace. We think of being alone, quiet, okay? But everybody understands that in that sort of situation, you would have peace. Hearing the waves in the quiet of the home, clean, nothing to do where you can just relax. But what about a peace that passes understanding? The only time you would need that is if peaceful doesn't make sense based upon your circumstances. Right? So it's contrary to circumstances. Notice we've gone through peace, grace, and joy. That sounds a lot like something else in Scripture. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness. Does that sound familiar? You see, all of these are gifts from God. They do not correlate with circumstances. 
This is the fruit of the Spirit of God in our lives. Let's go on. I'm going to read a couple more verses. This is a little bit more about uh, Sukkot. Deuteronomy 16, next two verses, starting at verse 16. It says, three times a year, all of your men are to appear in the presence of Adonai your God in the place which he will choose. At the fe festival of Matzah, so that's Passover, at the feast of Shavuot, which is Pentecost, and at the feast of Sukkot, they are not to show up before Adonai empty-handed, but every man is to give what he can in accordance with the blessing that Adonai your God has given you. So don't show up in the hand that do not be stingy, be generous to the Lord. It is a commandment for them all to show up, which is why there were so many Jewish people in Jerusalem from all around the world at the time of Pentecost and at the time of Passover. Pretty significant events in Yeshua's life. Yeah, we have the death of Yeshua, the resurrection of Yeshua. This was a public event, guys, with thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people surrounding Jerusalem in camps. Which is why Peter says, you, you knew better. You killed the Messiah. He, was, he pulled no punches. All right. Now here, let's uh, read a couple of verses beforehand. Now this is again a command. Rejoice at your festival. There you go. It is a command to rejoice. You, your sons, your daughters, your male and female slaves, the Leverim and the foreigners, the orphans, the widows living among you, Seven days you are to keep the festival of Adonai your God in the place that Adonai your God chooses, because Adonai your God will bless you on all your crops and all your work, so you are to be full of joy. Okay, now let's jump over another passage in 1 Kings chapter 8. Now when the Kohanim came out of the holy place, this is, okay, 1 Kings chapter 7, do you know what 1 Kings chapter 7 is? That is where Solomon has just finished building the temple, or he's building the temple and just finished building the temple. Praise to the Lord to make this place the place of his dwelling. Ask the Lord, come and fill this place. And the Lord answers and said, I will fill this place with my spirit. And this is what happened. It says, when the Kohanim came out of that holy place, the cloud filled the holy place, the house of Adonai, so that because of the cloud, the Kohanim could not stand up to perform their service. You ever heard of being slain in the spirit? Uh, did you know that it was a biblical thing? Yeah, this is slain in the spirit. They could not stand. If you can't stand, what are you doing? Well, you're either on your knees or on your face. You can't stand. They could not stand because the weight of the glory of God was so strong. And the glory of Adonai filled the house of Adonai. And Shlomo said, or Solomon said, Adonai said that he would live in thick darkness, but I have built you a magnificent house, a place where you can live forever. All right. Now, um, Owen brought up Hebrews. How many uh, got a chance to just go through Hebrews? I was, uh, yeah, we, we, got a, we had a chance to go through Hebrews. It was great uh, to have you guys with us. And we went through Hebrews, just reading through it. Just get the flavor of what, what's going on. Hebrews 1 verse 3, let's talk about the glory of God. You see, this son, talking of Yeshua, is the radiance of the Shekinah, the very expression of God's essence, upholding all that exists by his powerful word. And after he, he, had, uh, after he had, through himself, made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of Hagdullah the Mivroim. Uh, what's the translation of that? The high power, the great power. All right, I'm going to read it from the TLV as well. Just before Peter is Hebrews 1 verse 3. This sun is the radiance of his glory, the imprint of his being, upholding all things by his powerful word. When he made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Majesty on high. So that's this Hagadullah Bamevroim. Bamevroim. What does Bamevroim mean? You said power. Majesty. 
power, kingly glory. That's what it means. When we're singing majesty, majesty, majestic as a king enthroned in his splendor, majesty. You see, Yeshua is the glory of God. John wrote this in his gospel. John chapter 1, verse 14. It says this. Go ahead and switch the slides. There we go. The Word became a human being and lived with us, and we saw His Shekinah, His glory. Shekinah, the glory. The glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Why does, why does uh, the translator use Shekinah? The Shekinah. Sometimes people will pronounce it the Shekinah. Apparently, my, my pronunciation sounds much more like your female neighbor than it does the glory of God. There's, there's, you can change the pronunciation just slightly, and, 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 and it's, I, I get accused of that by your feet. She's like, no, 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 don't say it that way. Say it this way. I'm like, yes, the glory of God. The glory of God. Why? Because the glory of God that filled the, pre- that filled the temple was the same as the glory of God that covered the tabernacle. And a pillar of cloud and a, and a pillar of fire by night. It was the visible, manifest presence of God. Now, wait a second. John says three verses later that no one has, four verses later from this, no one has seen God at any time. Did you know that? Well, then then how did we see, oh, wait a second. He says, we see the Shekinah. We see the glory cloud. Yeshua is a walking glory cloud. He is the word of God made flesh. All right, let's talk a little bit about Yeshua at Sukkot. So here's a, a good a good photo that I got from the you know from the first century. Good photo from the first century. Yeah, yeah, that looks good. There you go. That's my dad joke for the day. Yes, yes. Didn't even get any of my kids to chuckle. There you go. All right. <laughs> so in Yeshua's day, obviously the temple was still standing. And uh, we have a great example in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Now, just go back to the previous one because that's too small to read. I'll just read it out and you can listen. After this, Yeshua traveled around the Galilee, intentionally avoiding Judah, because the Judeans were out to kill him. But the festival of Sukkot in Judah was, was near. So his brothers, this is his earthly brothers, said to him, Leave here and go to Judah so that your Talmudim can see the miracles you do. For no one wants to become, no one who wants to become known acts in secret. If you're doing these things, then show yourself to the world. You see, his brothers spoke this way uh, because they had not yet put their trust in him. Yeshua said to them, my time has not yet come, but for you, any time is right. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I am telling it how wicked its ways are. You go up to the festival. As for me, I'm not going up to the festival now because the right time for me has not yet come. Now, having said this, he stayed in the Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the festival, he too went up, not publicly, but in secret. You see, Yeshua, this this time in, in John, John chapter 7, this was not at the end of his life. He knew that his time had not come, and he was not trying to get outside of God's plan. However, he does end up going up to the tabernacle. Now, to understand this, there's two different ceremonies you've got to understand that were going on during the festival, the feast, Sukkot. The first is the water-pouring ceremony. So if we go to the next two slides. One, two. There we go. Water pouring ceremony. There was a feast at this t- a festival at this time where, or, or, you know, a ritual, if they, you will, where, where the high priest would come down and get water every single day of the feast. They would grab some water. Uh, I think it, from, it was from the pool of Siloam, and they would walk up the stairs to the, the temple and pour it out as a libation offering, a, a drink offering to the Lord. And it would get bigger, and like as more and more people were coming throughout the week, it would get bigger, and people would, would uh, follow them and follow them, and they would sing Hosanna, and they would thank the Lord for his provision, and thank the Lord for, for the rain. And, uh, and John chapter 7, in the middle of this festival, in the middle of this water-pouring ceremony, 
This is what Yeshua cries out in the temple. Now the last day of the festival, Hoshana Rabbah, Yeshua stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me and drinking. Whoever puts his trust in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from his inmost being. So here they are pouring out the water on the altar, pouring out the water on the altar, and Yeshua stands up in the temple and says, I'm the living water. I am the living water. Come to me if you are thirsty, and I will give you drink. He who drinks of me, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. There was another ceremony that went on at that time, and that is the illumination of the temple. Uh, they would set up massively tall uh, um, uh, candelabra in the tabernacle, and it was said that the entire hillside all around Jerusalem was lit up by the light. These, these candelabra were something like 20 to 30 feet tall, massively tall, and they just, you know, they were the spotlights of the day, if you would, and they just shone light throughout the entire, entire valley. And in the middle of this, probably a little bit later from when he said the water thing, we get this in John chapter 8, verse 12. Yeshua spoke to them again and says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light which gives life. You see, he's surrounded by massive candelabras, and he says, I'm the light of the world. You think these lights are big. If you follow my light, you will never walk in darkness. If you drink my water, you'll never be thirsty again. Let's go on. We're going to talk about the tabernacle forever. We've gone through Revelations before, and we've talked about this before, but at the end of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, because the old heaven and the old earth had passed away, and the sea was no longer there, so no more ocean. And I also saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, the heaven from God, prepared like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, See, God's Shekinah is with mankind. And he will live with them, and they will be his people, and he himself, God will them, with them, will be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning, crying, or pain, because the old order has passed away. And this is at the end of the thousand years of Yeshua's reigning. This is at the end of all things, or the end of all things for this age, anyway the end of this universe. God will roll this universe up like a scroll. Um, and if you think that that's outside of God's ability, uh, we had this great conversation a couple of weeks ago about the atom. Did you know that nobody's ever seen the inside of an atom? Does any, everybody know that? So the pictures of an atom, that, how many have seen a picture of an atom? What is it? Is it a picture of an atom? No, what is it? It's a model, a model, it's a diagram. See, the best microscopes we have are called electron microscopes, and they shoot electrons. And so we're able to see atoms, and they just look like, well, they look like spheres. But we can't see inside. We have no idea what holds the atom together. We have a model, a guess. God at any time, God specifically says that he holds the universe in his hand. God holds the entire universe together by his word. Every atom is held together by his word, by his power, because he said it's that way. And at any time, he can just, you know, decide, you know what? I'm going to let go. And every atom will fall apart. There will be none left, and it will roll up like a scroll. But then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and that's our, that's our eternal dwelling. All right, let's go on to the next one. It's, uh, it's a commandment in the scriptures, in Leviticus chapter 40. Uh, just leave it on, no, you can just uh, leave it on this one, it's a better picture. Leviticus chapter uh, 23 verse 40 says this, On the first day you shall take the product of a citron tree, an etrog, uh, branches from palm trees, which is lulav, and boughs of leafy trees, or hasadim, uh, or hadassim, sorry, hadassim, not 
yeah, sorry, Hadassim, or Myrtle, and Willows of the Brook, or Avorot. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So you're supposed to get uh, some palm branches and uh, some a citron fruit and some leafy trees and some, uh, and some willows. And then you rejoice before the Lord. You wave them before the Lord. It's a, it's a wave offering. And this is just a way of celebrating God's goodness. He has provided for the trees. Palms produce dates. You know, uh, they have fruit. Willows don't produce anything, but they, they look kind of nice and give us shade. Uh, myrtles have a nice smell, but they don't have great fruit. And then you have the etrog, which smells nice and is a good fruit as well. All right, so you've got the, what they call the four species. And so we rejoice before the Lord. And it's very traditional to read through Psalm 118. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a responsive reading. I'll read, and then you can uh, read the words that are in bold. All right? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. In my anguish I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. That means kill them, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Okay. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live, and I will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness, and I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous enter. I will give you thanks for, my, for answering me. You have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day of the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hands, join in the festal, festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Let's say this together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love endures forever. Amen. Amen. As you can see, there's a lot of what we would say messianic passages in that passage. Uh, the stone that the builders rejected, who is that? Yeshua, that's right. And you'll notice it says, Baruch Abab B'Shem Adonai. Did you catch that? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, this is a declaration of the people towards their Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, welcoming the king into Jerusalem. And one day, Yeshua says, that will happen. In fact, he says he will not return until that day that it happens, that Jerusalem will welcome him back in as king. 
Matthew 23. All right, let's uh, close out with the Hoshana service. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. All right. Hoshan, Hoshana le, le ma'anach adonenu Hoshana. Let's say this together. Please save us for your sake, our God. Please save. Ellie, I'm going to get you to come up and help me. Can you grab the microphone? I know, I know. And my tongue is tied. I'm sorry. All right. Okay. Hoshiana, Lama Anach, Borenu, Hoshiana. Let's say this together. Please save us for your sake, our Creator. Please save. Hoshiana, Lama Anach. Please save us for your sake, our Redeemer. Please save. Hoshiana Lama Ancha Dorshenu Hoshiana. Please save us for your sake, our attender. Please save. Go for it. Oh. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua, salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. All right, thank you. Yeshua gives this invitation. John chapter 7, at this festival, he says, If anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me and drinking. Now, I know some of uh, may have heard it, come to me and drink, but uh, it's in the progressive tense, meaning it's an ongoing thing. You know, how many believe, how many have gone to the Lord before and, and drank from the Lord and be satisfied with the Lord and received the Holy Spirit? How many of you have received Yeshua and have gone to the Lord and received him? Did you know that it is a continual going to him to be filled? That is a continual thing. Uh, if you don't understand that, look at Acts chapter 4, because Acts chapter 4 has the same people in it as Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 4, they ask again to be filled afresh with the Spirit of God. There's an ongoing filling, an ongoing drinking from the Lord. I'm going to close with uh, just this, this story on the Ushpazim. The Ushpazim, it's, uh, it's too small to, to read. I'll, I'll read it in just a minute. The Ushpazim is a, a, a guest, a, a, a visitor. When you invite somebody into your home, that's, that's an Ushpazim. And it's a mitzvot to invite people, strangers, into your home for the feast day. The Ushpazim. Uh, there's a great movie out called if you want to see uh, a good Jewish movie with English subtitles, Hebrew movie with English subtitles, it's a great movie. But who is the guest that we need to invite into our homes on this day? Well, let's see, Matthew chapter 17, 1 through 8. Six days later, Yeshua took Kepha, Yaakov, his brother, and Yochanan, and led them to a high mountain privately. And as they watched, he began to change form, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became white like light. And then they looked, and they saw Moshe and Eliyahu speaking with him. Kepha said to Yeshua, It is good that we are here. Lord, let's put up three shelters, three Sukkot, if you want, and one for you, one for Moshe, one for Eliyahu. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And the voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the Talmudim had heard this, they were so frightened that they fell down on the ground. But Yeshua came and touched them and says, Get up, don't be afraid. When they opened their eyes, they saw only Yeshua by himself. Yeshua is the ultimate guest that we are called to invite into our homes, the homes of our lives. We are called to invite him into our lives. Yeshua said he is the water of life. If you want to try and get satisfaction from the world, it is temporary. 
It is passing. It will fail you. When the, when the scripture says that the wages of sin is death, God's not kidding around. He's not mincing words. Sin earns death. Some sins kill faster than others. Murder is a good example. They lead to death faster than others. Others, like unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, kill us a lot slower. In fact, they kill us over many years to the point we start dying inside. We become self-absorbed, self-focused, selfish. That's the opposite of loving, by the way. I know the whole culture says, you've got to think about yourself. You've got to think about number one. Unfortunately, Jesus says, you have to die to yourself. And you've got to think about God. And seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the other things that you're looking for in life will be added to you. But you must seek first, it's a priority, the kingdom of God. So I'm going to offer an invitation, the same invitation that Yeshua offered. And that is to come and drink from the Lord. If you have not accepted the Lord, if you've not made that first step, I'm looking at everybody and I, I think I know where pretty much everybody in this room is, so I'll focus on those who might be online. If you have not accepted Yeshua and today is the day of salvation, today is that day, to come to Yeshua and to drink from him. But if you would like a refreshing from the Lord, that's a second thing. If you'd like a refreshing, I'll get you to stand up. I know I'm standing. If you want the Lord to refresh you, I encourage you to stand up. And I'm just going to close with this prayer. Lord, we come to you and we choose to drink. Lord, we lay aside the things that so easily entangle us. Lord, the sins, Lord, we just repent, Lord, of anything that we have done. Lord, we have spent this week with Yom Kippur, remembering sins, repenting of sins, and Lord, trying to set things right. And Father, we lay these things down before you, and we come to you, and Lord, we ask you to fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord, with boldness to speak your word. Fill us, Lord, with the strength that we need to get through every single day of the week. We ask for this in Yeshua's name and by his authority. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. I'm going to close there. Uh, we're going to close with, the, um, with the, uh, the, the drinking. But before we do that, there is time to actually ask a couple of questions about Sukkot. And, and I know that it was a somewhat brief. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, you willing yep, to hand this around? Great. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it next week at the camp, but it will be, you know, unplugged, yeah. right? That's the whole point of camping is to be unplugged. So we're going to talk through the scriptures. And of course, uh, you know, uh, questions are always welcome. But are there any questions today? Yeah. Yes, right yes. here. Okay. Go for it. So with anger, Yes. okay, a situation that's happened this week, yep. I'm angry. Sure. Like, I'm angry. Yes. And I haven't cried or anything like that, but I'm just like angry with yep. it. Is that, because I know about righteous anger and then there's anger with like, so. Yep. So I see you're correct. So anger, there's a scripture that says, yeah. in your anger, do not sin. Which by definition, and I apologize for mentioning anger specifically in those sins without clarifying. Uh, in, in that sense, anger itself is an emotion that is not sin. Jesus was angry, right? God is angry. Well, God doesn't sin. Jesus didn't sin. So guess what? Anger is not sin. In your anger, do not sin. But there's another part to that. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Uses a slightly more emphatic term. Your wrath, Okay. Um, in this sense, anger is, is a normal emotional response to pain and to, to hurt, right? To, to pain, okay? It's a normal response. Somebody hurts you, they jump on your toe, rah, <laughs> you get angry, okay? Don't sin. Control your tongue. James talks about controlling your tongue in your anger. 
All right, so while you can be angry, it's not acceptable to cuss, swear, use foul language, use God's name in vain, and those sorts of things. That would be sin. That would, you know, be blasphemy if you're using God's name in vain, but, you know, that would be sinning in your anger. But if there's anger between you and your spouse, it's actually, the thing about it is God says, don't go to bed angry. Anger very quickly grows into unforgiveness and bitterness. Or bitterness, or unforgiveness grows into bitterness. Anger grows. Anger, do, is, anger cannot stay contained. It's like fire. Fire either you can, you, you use it for something very specific. You control your anger. The most terrifying thing in the world is a person who is in full control, who is angry but is in full control of themselves. That's why we use fire. We use anger. Uh, to, to, do, to accomplish a lot of things, okay? But we don't sin. We, it's important in a relational setting that you don't go to bed angry. So we have a responsibility to deal with our anger. You can't just not deal with your anger. It will grow. It will grow. In, it's not to do with my family. It's outside. I know. It's already on the outside. Sure. So how do I deal with that? Well, in those... Say, so if it's not somebody that you can address personally then it is a matter of giving it over to the Lord. And we have a responsibility to take our petitions, our anger, to the Lord. Look at the Psalms. David did it all the time. He's like, God, smash them in their teeth. You know, I like that Psalm. I pray that Psalm. Yes, but then we can turn that, like Ellie was saying, we can go, well, what is the action we can take? We can, we can call our local representative and petition unjust laws, unjust judges, right? There's a ton of unjust judges in this country. There's a ton of unjust laws. The more that I find out about it, the more that I'm absolutely horrified at some of the laws that are on the books here in Australia. Some of the things that we say are acceptable. It's absolutely horrendous. And therefore, it's what, you know, the police kind of, we, we blame the police for fulfilling the law, but that is their sole purpose. Their entire job is to do what the law says. They're not supposed to do more or less than that, right? So don't get angry at the police. Go call your politicians and get the laws changed. We live in a society that has many unjust laws. All right? so if, but that is making a decision from that anger. So, but it's not the, the wrath, the wrath that is, you know, do not go to sleep on your wrath. That's, a, that's an interpersonal thing. All right? And then there's a scripture that says, as much as it depends upon you, live at peace with all men. Okay? As much as it depends upon you what you can do, all right? So part of this is, yes, we shouldn't pick up other people's offenses. We can empathize with others, but we, we cannot help them carry their burden, but we shouldn't be carrying it for them, if that makes You can help carry them in the middle of it, but we can't take it on, all right? We can't take on other, we shouldn't take on other people's offenses. Not that we can't, we do, don't we? We take on other people's offenses. That's one of the, one of the reasons that there's a 12-step program here is to, what is it, to get rid of habits, hang-ups, and hurts. Well, those habits, hang-ups, and hurts usually are because of pain, because of unforgiveness, because of... And one of the biggest healing things in these, in these groups is learning to forgive, learning to repent and learning to forgive. All right? So, so this is exactly what we're talking about. So anger in and of itself is not sin, but anger will turn into something. All right? You have to deal with it. You can't just ignore it. Um, it's the classic, you know, I, if I go home and, and I ask my wife, how, how, how are you doing? She says, fine. Guess what? She ain't fine. And I better figure it out because if I don't figure it out by that day, what, how is she feeling the next day? If I ignore her, yeah, yeah, how are you feeling today? Yesterday you were fine. I'm fine, okay? Two types of anger, this is the other part. Um, there's two types of anger. There's simmering anger and boiling over anger, right? Simmering anger and boiling over anger. God, God's simmering anger is seen throughout scriptures. He's angry, he's angry, he's angry at the sin. But eventually that anger boils over into action. So anger that boils over into action, that's anger, that, yeah, so two different types. So that's a lot on those two things. So anger itself, no, but you better deal with it. 
Yes, yeah, don't associate with an angry man. Now, that's obviously a, a habitually angry person. Somebody who is given over to anger, who has a short fuse. Yeah. Okay? Now, I used to be proud of my short fuse. You want to talk about this is, I mean, this is, this is who I was, right? I was proud that I boiled over quickly. But pride and boiling over quickly, neither one seemed to be fruits of the Spirit. I vaguely remember long-suffering and patience, but neither one of them are short fuses. Yeah? So, you know, it's looking at Yeshua, when he was angry, he had been in that temple hundreds of times before he drove out the money changes. And he did it very specifically to fulfill some scriptures, and he sat there and braided a whip. You want to talk about thinking about what you're about to do. You're sitting there braiding a whip, and then he chased the money changers out. And he says, you, should, you know, you've made this house into a den of thieves and it's fulfilling scripture. But he was very, very measured in how he responded in anger. All right. I mean, look at, look at us. How has God judged Australia? Have we flaunted our sin before God? And yet he has been merciful to us. We, we, we think of, you know, if I'm patient for an hour... That's pretty good. God's patient for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. In the case of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, he was patient for 400 years. God is really patient. Okay, so, so you know, again, we need, need to recognize our anger. You better be in control. If it's not in control, then you've got another whole, that's when you sin, right? But I understand what you're saying. I'm, me too. You, you swing between anger and uh, anger and, and pain, right? And, and Lord, what do I do with this? And that's exactly what you're supposed to do. You should take it to the Lord. Lord, Lord do something, God, because I can't. My hands are tied. Which is what David did. So that's just... Okay, any other questions? Over here, Stanley? All right. Fast delivery. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. Uh, Northern Hemisphere, of course, they're in their end of their summer there now, so they're, right. they're harvesting, and, and, and here we are, we're, we're just starting into our spring where we're planting. That's right. So, so it's uh, we're the, the opposite, but yet we, we still recognize um, the season that, that the Lord's um, made. That's right. Yeah. So where does this lead? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What's the question? Mm. Yeah, no, it's just a comment, I think. Oh, okay, okay. No worries. Yes, you are correct. Uh, that, the parts of, it's part of being from the ends of the earth. We're upside down down here, I think. I think we're the furthest from the end. Well, I think New Zealand might be a tiny bit further. Yeah, yeah just a little bit. So they've got its beat, but not by much. And there's not many people over there, so we'll, we'll ignore New Zealand today. <laughs> There's kiwis here, though. Oh, there are. Mm. I know, <laughs> and I love them. I love it's them. interesting you say the ends of the earth because that is actually mentioned in scripture. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Why do you think so many Jewish people have come to Australia? They're trying to get as far away from everything else as possible. <laughs> There's a huge migration to Australia of Jewish people during World War II. But I vaguely remember reading a story recently about somebody who tried to run away from God Jonah. and ran away as far as he yeah. knew how. Jonah. Do you guys remember? Did you read yeah. that recently? Jonah. Yeah, Tarshish. You know, Tarshish is, yeah. is thought to be either, either in Spain or in England, possibly. It's a possibility that Tarshish actually referred to England. The tin mines in England were actually on Solomon's trading route. Isn't that crazy to think? That's pretty cool. I like that. But that being said, Tarshish was as far as, that was the end of the world. They, where was he going? Away from God. And God is currently calling Jewish people back to the land. There is a call and a promise because God says, I will meet with you there in judgment. Yes. How's it going? Good. What's your question? How do you get Jesus to like um, float? With you. How do you like drink from Jesus? How do you ask Jesus into your heart to fill you? You use your words. You just ask him, right? Um, Jesus talked to the lady, the woman at the well, 
and he, she was getting water, and he says, can I have a drink of water? And, you know, how are you going to get water? And he says, if you ask me, Jesus said this to the lady, if you ask me for a drink of water, I would give you water that would be like a well of living water that bubbles outside of you. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. He says he was talking about the Holy Spirit living inside each one of us. And the Holy Spirit is a gift that Jesus said he would give when he left. He says, I'm going to leave and I will send the Holy Spirit from the Father and he will fill you and he will be with you and he will comfort you and he will remind you of all the words that I've said to you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And so when we come to the Lord and we ask Jesus to come into our lives, he does that most really through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. In a very real sense, he fills us. So the Spirit of God comes and dwells. And so we just ask the Lord to fill us. Yes? Why did God kill the dinosaurs? Why did God kill the dinosaurs? That is a great question. Uh, and this, I think, is a good question to end on. But, I, well, do you remember a thing called the flood? Yeah, see, everybody usually forgets about the flood when they think of... What? That's right, Noah and the ark. So, you know, there were some... Di I think there were some dinosaurs on the ark. I do. But did you know that 90% of dinosaurs are smaller than a small dog? Did you know 90% of dinosaurs are this big? And did you know that even the biggest one, Brontosaurus, how big is a Brontosaurus egg? Did you know? It's about this big. So I don't think that Noah had big dinosaurs on the ark. I think he had babies because it says that God brought them. God brought all the animals to the ark. The problem was is after the flood, the earth had changed. Okay? So before the flood, there doesn't seem to be any mention of any oceans. There doesn't seem to be any rain. Uh, and, and it was perfect temperature everywhere. It's like perfect paradise temperature everywhere. Constant 75 degrees, beautiful sunny days, perfect time to grow. No winter, no summer, just, just perfect weather, okay? But afterwards, you had rain and storms and snow and cold and, and heat and deserts and all these other things after the flood. And so a lot of dinosaurs, I think, just died. But I have got another question. Um, if there was a crocodile that was as big as this stage, from, from that black pole to that black pole, what do you think the crocodile might eat? Do you th what do you think the crocodile would eat? Yeah, well, I'd call that a dinosaur. Do you know dinosaur means big lizard? Crocodile is a type of a lizard. But if you had a crocodile that big, do you think they might eat people? Mmm, yeah. You know, there's a photo in Africa where the army was called in to kill a crocodile that was as big as this stage. You know that's bigger than most dinosaurs? That's bigger than most, of, most dinosaurs we have. So the other problem is, I think we killed the dinosaurs. I think we did, because they were eating people. Well, it's, it's him or me. I'm going to kill him. If, he, if I had a dinosaur, a T-Rex, running after my family, I'd run for a little bit, sure, but you know what? I'd probably get a bunch of other people, we'd get some guns, and we'd go hunting. Just saying. If it's me or him, you know what? I think we killed the dinosaurs. Just like we killed the dodos and so on and so forth. So. All right, let's... And killed the Tasmanian devil. And, like David and Goliath, exactly. A big, big lizard, big man. You know what? Let's take him on. All right, let's close there. And uh, we'll close with the blessing of God's provision. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Thank the Lord for the bread that he's provided. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, 
King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Amen. If you'll all stand, and we will close with the blessing given to Aaron. Yeverechech Adonai vayishmarecha Yahe Adonai panavalecha vechunecha Yisa Adonai